Kia ora everyone. Um, welcome to today's webinar. So today I'm really excited to be kicking off the first of the water series of the, of the autumn webinar series. We still have a couple more webinars coming up over the next two weeks. So do remember to, to go and sign into those, check out the website for details. Um, and all the ones that we've already had are available for, um, they've been recorded they've, and, and they're now available for, for viewing. So check out our website to, to find those. Uh, don't forget that we are running a competition to win a year's membership, either for yourself if you're an individual or a student, or for um, an SME supplier if you're a company. So you can gift a, a year's membership to, to an SME and get them involved in the LCA community. Uh, so to be in with a chance to win, you need to be registered and attend the sessions and to be able to answer a short quiz about what you've heard. So that will be coming out once we've finished all of the sessions. So good luck. I would also like to thank all of our LCANS members because uh, the series is made possible by our membership subscriptions. So um, much appreciated. And uh, on that, if you would like to help to contribute, um, if you join LCANS now, your membership will actually be covered through the FY23 membership cycle to the end of May so, uh, next year. So uh, it's a good time to join because you get some, you get some, you get one free month. We're later in the series now, um, but do consider joining if you if you found these useful. With no further ado, I am delighted to welcome Sarah McLaren as our speaker for today. Uh, Sarah is the director of the New Zealand Life Cycle Management Centre and also professor in life cycle management and uh, at Nasi University. Um, her research is focused on development and application of life cycle assessment and techniques. So. Um, really exciting to have her here to talk to us about water footprinting techniques and to get us started. So I will hand over. Sarah, thank you. What I'm presenting today is really based on um, my experience, um, both of life cycle assessment and uh, the development of uh, water use assessment within life cycle assessment um, and my involvement in the ISO Water Footprint Working Group as the New Zealand representative, which met between um, 2010 and 2015 and resulted in the um, publication of the ISO 1440, 1446 Water Footprint Standard. Um, since then, probably the major, uh, more recent initiative has been through the FAO um, LEAP um, partnership and uh, they have um, published um, some guidelines on water footprint assessment for livestock if you want to um, see what's been going on um, in the latest iteration. Uh, first of all, just a kind of overview of the issue. Back in 2015, the World Economic Forum had this to say about the issue of water use. Global water crises are the biggest threat facing the planet over the next decade. Um, and indeed, the um, Sustainable Development Goals also has goal number six, which is focused on clean and accessible um, water. A recent report from the FAO, um, State of Food and Agriculture Overcoming Water Challenges in Agriculture, some of its key messages I've cut and pasted here. Um, so they say, for example, that 62% um, uh, of the world's irrigated crop plant is under high or very high water stress. 3.2 billion people live in agricultural areas with high to very high water shortages. The annual amount of available freshwater resources per person has declined by more than 20% in the past two decades. So um, I think it's fairly clear that this is an issue. I'll give you a short overview of water footprinting as a way of trying to assess the um, scarcity and availability of water for different uses. Um, and then I'm going to run through some of the key issues that you have to deal with, or maybe you don't deal with them, but you should be aware of them in water footprinting and finish with a couple of case studies on uh, concrete manufacture and on New Zealand milk production. Okay, so two main approaches have really evolved um, in the water footprinting space. So the first one, which um, was developed in the early 2000s, um, is the water footprint network, water footprint approach. 
that's shown, uh, their manual is shown on the left here from 2011. And then on the right, we have the ISO water footprint standard, which was published in um, 2014. Um, and um, that one is based on uh, a life cycle assessment. Now, I say the water footprint standard is based on life cycle assessment, but in fact, both those um, types of approaches are based on using a life cycle perspective. And that's illustrated by this diagram here, which is from the water footprint study of New Zealand milk production that I'll go through um, uh, uh, in a bit more detail towards the end. Um, I'm sure you know all about the life cycle perspective, but just in case anyone's new to it, um, what it means is looking from cradle to grave at products. So for milk, we've got milk coming out at the um, bottom right of this diagram, but we are accounting for water use all the way back up the supply chain um, to the top left, the brought in feed, production of the fertilizer, pesticides, fuel, etc., as well as the um, uh, cows grazing in New Zealand, largely on um, outdoor pasture. OK, so what we're doing in, when we do um, water, footprint, water footprinting is looking at all of those activities and their water use relative to the functional unit. Um, so for this study, it was um, one kilogram of fat and protein corrected milk. For the water footprint network approach, um, what we're interested in is looking at the total amount of water that's used to produce the products, like a kilogram of milk. And that would typically be measured uh, as use of green water, blue water, and a grey water footprint. So green water is the um, water from rainfall that you might find in the soil, like stored in the soil. Um, blue water is water that you would find in rivers, um, lakes, and so on. Um, and the grey water is a way of um, expressing the amount of water that you need to um, dilute any pollutants in the water to a level where they're not going to be a problem. You, When you do the water footprint network approach, you would measure each of these and you might add them to get together to get a total, um, a total water footprint. OK, so that's a kind of resource based um, perspective on water use. And it's also um, often called a productivity um, footprint. So we'll be looking at the total amount of water required to produce one kilogram uh, um, of milk. Uh, the ISO 1446 is measuring the environmental impacts associated with water use. OK, so it's not water use per se. It's the uh, potential environmental impacts associated with that water use. And generally nowadays that's expressed um, for the quantity of water use as the water is called the water scarcity footprint. OK, and that might sit alongside your other environmental um, impact categories in your LCA study, or it could stand alone if you're just doing a water footprint study. Um, for water quality, um, what we do in LCA is generally look at things like aquatic ecotoxicity and eutrophication and use them to measure impacts on impacts on water quality. In the LCA community, um, we were a bit late off the block in terms of um, developing uh, techniques for water footprinting. And really, uh, researchers only got really interested in it from about 2000 and seven onwards. And you can see that in this uh, in this diagram. But then it kind of accelerated and loads of people um, got interested in it. Um, and I think maybe it's worth noting that one of the significant changes, which is shown on the right of this diagram, is initially people were focusing on the amount of water withdrawn for use in an activity relative to availability of that water in a specific geographical area. But then over time that changed and now generally what people do is look at the um, 
consumption of water in a geographical area relative to its availability in that area. And what we mean by consumption as opposed to withdrawal is um, water that's evaporated, water that's transpired through a um, plant, water that might be integrated into the product, and water that might um, be used and then put back into the lake or um, uh, river, but in a different water catchment. Okay, so it's actually been permanently removed from the water catchment where it was withdrawn. Okay. Um, so and now in LCA, people will generally be talking about consumption rather than withdrawal of water, which can be quite significant difference when you're thinking about something like hydroelectricity, where you're just kind of putting water, you're using water in the sense of putting it through a turbine, but then it goes back into the same um, river, okay, or water used for cooling purposes, it might just go straight back again within the same catchment. So that's not water consumption then, apart from what's evaporated. If we're doing a water footprint network approach, which is uh, the more kind of generic terminology now is water productivity um, assessment, we'll look at use of water in a number of different activities and add those values together. Okay, and um, some significant points to note about that that were kind of highlighted in that FAO LEAP um, partnership report recently um, is that it includes um, water, green water, um, as I've said already, um, and both direct and indirect blue um, water use. That's uh, Direct water use is water use in the activity you're directly interested in. So that may be um, uh, irrigation of the pasture, um, but it also includes like the water use in the production of fertilizers. Um, and the recommendation through this latest publication was that green and blue water should be reported separately. If we're doing a water scarcity assessment, where we're interested in the environmental impacts associated with water, then we quantify the water used in each activity and we multiply it by an impact factor, like a weighting factor, which reflects the significance of that use in that particular area. OK, um, the kinds of issues to be aware of and that are addressed uh, in different approaches here. I've talked about withdrawal versus consumption. Um, there's the issue of the geographical specificity of those impact assessment factors. Do we use an average for a country or do we go down to individual water catchments um, in assessing the water availability? There's also a temporal element because obviously the amount of um, water available in any catchment will vary over um, a year. So do we use an annual average or do we actually break it up by month and by the month in which the activity takes place? Uh, so recognising that water use in the middle of the summer might be more significant in terms of potential environmental impacts than water use in the middle of the winter when there's more water available. In LCA-based um, approaches, the focus is on use of blue, wa blue water rather than green water. And that's the idea there is that the green water, water from precipitation, is um, assessed as part of the land use impact category, although a uh, agreed method for that has yet to, the community has yet to reach consensus on that. When calculating the water availability in a catchment, the environmental flow requirements are subtracted from the total water available. So the idea is that you reserve a certain amount of water for the natural ecosystems in that area to use, if you like, before you look at what's available for your human activities. And then another thing to think about is, um, is it relevant to assess uh, uh, the different sources of water differently? So a uh, kind of key one here would be what's called fossil water, which is water in an aquifer that's maybe been looked up for thousands of years. So it's water that's thousands of years old. And if we um, 
if we take that out, should we be assessing it in the same way as surface water or not? It's again another issue that's really um, still got to be resolved. The um, LCA community has relatively recently agreed on a, what they call a consensus based approach called AWARE, which is avail stands for available water remaining. So that's the one that you will generally be see being used in LCA studies um, nowadays. Just to finish off quickly, I'm going to run through uh, very quickly a couple of case studies. So concrete manufacture in New Zealand. This was a study we did a while ago with um, brands and allied concrete. Um, and this was a master's student, Amber Mellor. She looked at 27 concrete batching plants um, in New Zealand and calculated the water footprint for one metre cubed of concrete. I won't, won't go into the details, but I just did want to highlight that the initial thing she did was to draw a flow diagram showing how water flowed through each of these batching plants. And there's an example of one here. Um, so they use both rainwater and water from the reticulated network um, that's used for truck washing and then as you move towards the right um, for the um, production of the um, concrete okay and the uh, width of these lines shows the relative quantities of water being used so you can see for this one uh, a large proportion of the water is from the reticulated network so it's treated water from the water um, purification system. Um, but here's another one where actually the majority of the water used is the rainwater. Okay, so when you start drawing these diagrams, you can get some insights into where the um, water is being sourced from. And arguably, if the rainwater is falling anyway onto the site, you might want to look at if you want to improve the water footprint of these facilities, capturing more of it so that it can be used rather than taking it out of the um, reticulated system. Second one was a water footprint of um, dairy milk production. I've already introduced that. That was done by colleagues at Ag Research. And I showed you the um, supply chain that they looked at. They did a really detailed study. Um, this shows, and they, sorry, they focused on dairy farms in the Waikato and in Canterbury. Okay, so this is a, the results in terms of total litres of water used per um, kilogram of fat and protein corrected milk. Um, and you can see that the Waikato uses more total uh, quantity of water used is higher than in Canterbury, but in Waikato, uh, the pastures are not irrigated. Um, so it's just all rainwater, whereas in Canterbury, it uses less, but some of it is, is uh, blue water use as opposed to green water use, the, the rainwater use. So if you're only interested in total water, you might say the Waikato was worse. But if you're interested in the use of blue water, then... Um, just looking at the quantities, you might say that um, Canterbury is worse because it has a larger quantity of blue water. However, um, they then went on to, um, rather than doing the um, volumetric water analysis, they then want, went on to do a water scarcity um, footprint using um, AWARE. And um, this shows the results for the Waikato milk. Um, and they've done it using um, three different kind of um, degrees of detail in the assessment. So the first one is to use the um, water scarcity, the impact assessment factors for at just at the New Zealand level and annual level. That's the yellow bar. And then they went on to say, OK, if we actually looked at the impacts occurring in different um, for the different activities actually where they are and the relative water scarcity there, you can see that you about quarter the water footprint result. And when you do that for incorporating the temporal dimension as well, um, then you, um, 
you also get that lower result. It actually doesn't change very much. That's for the Waikato. And then I've got here at the bottom, the can same thing done for the Canterbury milk. And you can see that actually it doesn't change those values um, very much. Um, but um, the important thing to note here is that the, the relative scale of um, impact is the same, whichever those levels of detail you go into. In other words, the um, Canterbury milk has the higher water footprint, remembering that we're looking at the blue water use here. OK, so just to finish off, um, hopefully what I illustrated with those two examples is that when you're looking at water use and you're um, interested in water footprinting, um, you, a really useful thing can be just to model the quantities of water used as a first step like we did for the concrete and see what you come up with. Um, if you're looking along a supply chain, as we do in LCA, and looking at the direct and indirect um, water use, then you probably want to look at doing a water footprint assessment because that will um, interpret the results relative to the availability of water in different areas. And these kinds of techniques are going to be, uh, I think, relatively more important as time goes on to demonstrate the environmental credentials of your products um, with that um, uh, increasing problem that we have got with water availability um, and an increasing population around the world. That's all. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. That was fantastic. Really good run through and an explanation. Um, uh, hopefully you have a little bit of time to, to stay for questions because oh. um, we have some coming through. Thank you. Um, and I, I might start if, I, if I'm allowed to. Really useful explanation of how it works. And I think for for those practitioners who are more used to maybe just assessing carbon footprint, um, it's obviously quite a different assessment and, and there's quite a lot more detail, um, the, which is the reason behind this, this webinar series being the now and the next, because everyone knows about carbon, but water is the next big thing and we know it's coming. And um, from your, I guess, from your perspective and your experience, how much have you seen uptake of this in New Zealand and, and around the world? Like, is it is it still very new and, and the next thing or, or is New Zealand behind the rest of the world or or do you not know? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think the ISO water footprint standard published in 2014 was a big kind of mm. jump forward um, in terms of more people thinking, well, actually, we need, do need to think about this. And um, yes, as you say, everyone does carbon footprinting, but I think if everyone was to think, what shall I do next after carbon footprinting, then water footprinting would be the next thing that they would think about. So I would say it's, um, um, yeah, not particularly different in terms of relative uptake compared with the um, rest of the world as regards carbon versus water in mm. New Zealand. Um, but it, yeah, we're, we're getting there. Yeah, I and I um it, in general we think of New Zealand not really having much of a problem with water scarcity but as you say it varies a lot between the regions um it's fascinating to see that study from from Canterbury and the Waikato ah yes actually and on that I think for New Zealand companies who are exporting it is potentially a point of um advantage so uh, uh, it's actually almost like more of a reason to do mm. it if you're in New Zealand because you are quite likely to look good compared with the rest of the world. That's if you're doing a water scarcity footprint. Yeah. Um, because of, as you say, the relative availability of water in New Zealand. Yeah, great point. Mm. Thank you. Um, so we have some questions coming through from, from Shreyasi. Um, she said, you mentioned uh, some of the challenges when using the water footprint network method, but what kind of methodological methodological changes, um, challenges would you note with respect to the AWARE method? So particularly with AWARE, what's, what do we need to think about? Um, well, the issue with, well, it's, it kind of, it's not just AWARE, it's all LCA methods, is about the geographical specificity and how much data that you've actually got. Because as we all know, when you do an LCA, you end up with activities that are kind of located typically all over the world. Um, so the issue is how you get 
detailed enough information about the water scarcity for those areas to say something meaningful. And particularly, as we showed with the um, uh, with the uh, um, milk study, it's it's about not just a country. It's about going within the country to a region and within the that region the time of year when you're actually extracting the water um so i think you have to be quite careful in interpreting results mm. if you don't have a lot of data mm. but for example that study the milk study showed that um, urea fertilizer production was actually quite significant in the waikato footprint for canterbury it was just the irrigation that dominated but um, yeah, yeah, production of a fertilizer <laughs> in uh, another country is um, you mm. know, something you might not think of immediately. Yeah, yeah, excellent point. Um, mm. Cool. Um, well, how how did you go about getting the the catchment level information for for that study? For because um, the New Zealand flows, as you say, are available. But yeah, what source did you use? Uh, well, sorry, I wasn't involved in that milk ah, study, so I, I um, know about it. Not <laughs> in that case, for <laughs> yes. the concrete plants, or did that not? <laughs> did for that the not concrete look? plants, it was mm. directly working with the um, well for, for water, directly working with each concrete um, mm. uh, producer, um, and um, then um, uh, Ramveer Singh, who's actually going to, I think, do the next seminar. Yeah was involved in that looking at that catchment level um analysis so um uh, we will ask okay, access to all the detailed databases <laughs> we can ask Fair enough. yes <laughs> thank you um ah and shreyas has also asked is any work being done in new zealand about developing regional characterization factors within the aware method um because we know that uh, in in australia alcas has very recently published um the methodology mm -hmm. that well the catchment level um, that should be used there yeah that would be a great thing to do it would uh, wouldn't it yeah maybe we should pick that up again with in the next two seminars yeah so sounds like a good plan yeah <laughs> <laughs> wonderful thank you um any more questions shirasi has all the questions <laughs> Uh -huh. But we do have another um, from Ray. Um, so thank you for your presentation. With individual farmers, how would you recommend incorporating the water footprinting approach when it comes to assessing farm environmental performance? Hmm. Good question. Um, so at the individual farm level and farm environmental management, I am not convinced. Well, usually it's dominated by irrigation. So if it's an irrigated farm. Um, I'm not convinced that kind of tacking on an impact assessment as an aware method or something like that to it particularly adds anything because it's not like the farmer's going to pack mm. up and move somewhere else and start producing elsewhere. True. So I think it's more about um, the actual measuring the quantities of water use and looking for efficiencies there. So water productivity type approach. Good point. Yeah, excellent point. Wonderful. Thank you. I think that might be all of our questions. So thank you. Obviously, you're, uh, you've provided such a good overview that everyone's needs have been satisfied. And as you say, we have two follow up seminars, which we'll dive into more detail as well. But yeah. um, really useful overview. Thank you, Sarah, so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Just to say um, thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, as mentioned, we, we this has been recorded, so it will be available hopefully in the next week or so um, on the Alcans website for, for anyone who wants to catch up on it. And all of the previous sessions have been recorded as well. So do go and check them out. Don't forget about our competition. And of course, the recordings, if you did happen to miss a session in the middle, the recordings might give you some of the answers to the quiz when we come to it. Um, and thank you again to our members. So we do have, we've got the sessions. Next week is actually Brent. Um, with water footprinting of, of kiwi wine and date, kiwi fruit wine and dates. And then Ranveer is the week after talking about agricultural products. So looking forward to, to diving into that detail then. Sarah, thank you again. Um, thank you to everyone and have a great week. <laughs>